Good morning. Welcome to a special edition of Coffee With. My name is Kate Wilkinson, and I'm here with the current president of Wheaton College, Dennis Hanna. Good morning, Dennis. Good morning. Welcome. So uh, the main reason why we're here today is to talk a bit about the refugee scholarship that you uh, announced just a week ago, talking largely about uh, offering a scholarship to a student uh, in uh, particularly a war-torn country. Um, and uh, is this a full scholarship, yes? It, it will be a full scholarship to a deserving and appropriate student uh, who will be a great member of our Wheaton community. And so what led to the creation of this scholarship? Uh, well, as you know, there was an executive order signed um, a week and a half ago on a Friday evening that uh, put significant restrictions on uh, international students from seven specific countries uh, from coming to the U.S., from international um, uh, citizens of all kinds, but obviously it affects students as well. The, the big issue for, for me and for the other leadership, the rest of the leadership team here at Wheaton College uh, is not so much those seven specific countries, but the, the message and the uh, signal that it sends to the world about you know, how welcoming uh, the U.S. is, and in particular higher education is. Um, there are over a million international students a year come to the U.S. to study. Uh, from, from every country on the face of the earth. We have over 70 countries represented here at Wheaton. Quite honestly, we have already seen a decline in the interest of international students in studying at Wheaton. And, you know, I think as a student here, I hope you value the perspective and the diversity that having students from all over the world brings to a, especially a small campus like this. So, you know, in thinking about something that was consistent with our values in creating this global and diverse community and taking some action that we knew could have an impact, um, that's where the discussions kind of worked their way around to let's offer an additional scholarship uh, for a student who is coming from a conflict area. Mm -hmm. Preference to those seven countries so that those students know that we are uh, here and still welcoming uh, to them. Uh, but we would accept students from uh, with a background that conflict has had an impact on their life. I would I would add that uh, we already have students here from those seven countries. We have students here from several other uh, parts of the world that would be described as conflict zones. Uh, and I think they are an important part of who we are and uh, they really have a big impact here on the college. So it was a well thought out process about, you know, how can we send a message to the international student community, the international community as a whole, that Wheaton is a pretty special place and that we are welcoming and uh, we do want to create that global environment here. So in a large part, it's not only uh, telling the students that are currently here that you know this is a community that's welcoming to them, but also is opening the doors for more students to come to Wheaton uh, from these countries that particularly may feel a level of persecution. Yep. Uh, yeah, we have you know about 15% of our population uh, comes from outside the U.S. and it has been growing. Mm -hmm. I would hate to see that decline because I do think it's an important element. Uh, and it does, I think, send a strong message to the current students who are here from outside the U.S. and hopefully encourages all of us here at Wheaton to be um, welcoming and inclusive in what we do on campus and in how we uh, shape this community with the new people that we add. Yes. So uh, what exactly are we expecting with this timeline? Uh, particularly, uh, this is a Facebook question from Saba. She wants to know what the timeline is for this refugee scholarship. Yep. Will we see the student uh, come to, to Wheaton next, week, uh, next year? Yeah, uh, I, I think that's a good possibility. Um, you know, a couple uh, things just to make sure that people are clear on. I mean, there has been some question about does this take away from a U.S. student, for example. So. Wheaton provides, this year, we will provide $41 million of financial aid, of which 92% of it goes to domestic U.S. students. And so even if you look at the percentage there, actually um, U.S. students get proportionally more of our aid than international students do. So this is an incremental commitment, uh, and so it's not really having that kind of a negative impact on others who are interested in coming to Wheaton. We've already had um, students here who have interviewed for uh, the scholarship, um, because remember, if you, if you read the, the announcement, it's uh, students who are in those countries or students who are already here in the U.S. as refugees. So on Friday, for example, we had a refugee from uh, one of those countries on campus interviewing. Mm -hmm. 
He actually had been wounded uh, in service of his country fighting with the U.S. soldiers. And I think that's exactly, you know, the kind of person that, uh, you know, we were thinking about, you know, somebody who really has sacrificed a lot, not just for himself and his country, but for, for us, for fighting for freedom. So um, we uh, have had many, many inquiries already. Um, we have a number of partners that we work with around the world, and that's how we have so many students here, and those partners have reached out to us and said, oh, we've got students from fill in the blank that might qualify for this. Uh, our expectation is actually the difficult decision is gonna be narrowing in on just one, because it's a small incremental investment of just one scholarship to choose the best person to bring here to the community. Uh, the deadline is uh, March 1st for applications for that. Mm -hmm. Uh, as I said, they're already rolling in, so I don't have any doubt in my mind that um, when we announced uh, decisions in April, that we'll have the first scholarship recipient who will be here in the fall. So I think one other question that's been raised, uh, largely just from interpretations and, mm -hmm. and questions about it, uh, this funding uh, for the scholarship is largely coming from uh, donors to the school, am I right? On that? Well, it's interesting that we didn't put a call out for, it wasn't a, an appeal for fundraising, but almost immediately, mm -hmm. uh, and quite pleasantly surprised, I would say, I was, and I know others were here as well, that the contributions have started rolling in. I wouldn't say that they have offset the full cost of the scholarship yet, because as you know, it's a large investment uh, for a full scholarship, but um, they will go a long way towards offsetting that, and it will not uh, offset any of the resources that we invest in other students and other financial aid. So it is an incremental investment on the part of the college, and we hope it will pay for itself uh, with the fundraising uh, impact that it has and also the positive benefit it has on everybody here at Wheaton. So. Now, this story actually did blow up quite a bit. It made it on uh, websites like Huffington Post, BuzzFeed, uh, Breitbart, uh, as well as Fox News. And as we were talking about early CNN, were you expecting this much traction? Uh, absolutely not. Um, we, if you think about it, over the last year, we've actually had kind of an interesting run of uh, positive and negative uh, publicity. So you just never know what actually is gonna bite when it comes to the news and you know what they're interested in. So last year, around the same time, we had the Wheaton versus Wheaton confusion with some of the actions they were doing that were perceived as uh, less than inclusive and we took a lot of the fallout because people thought it was us. Uh, hand delivering acceptance letters uh, in April actually went viral and was picked up even outside the US. Uh, and then our Title IX investigation also stimulated uh, quite a bit of press. So, um, you know, in doing this, you know, certainly you want to announce a scholarship so you don't just keep it internally. So, yes, we did share it with some of the local press and then it just kind of percolated and started getting picked up. Um, you know, it's some some might say and some would perceive it as you know a publicity stunt well you know we have no control over what other people pick up about us uh, and so i'm to be honest i'm pleased that something that is a strong statement of our values and that makes a strong statement about the impact of the executive order uh, has resonated with a, a broader audience it certainly has brought both positive and negative uh, feedback but you know, I think uh, it has created a great dialogue around uh, what's happening here in the U.S. Mm. So I want to transition a bit over to talking a bit about um, Trump and particularly uh, your commentary about the elections, um, uh, if you want to call it that, more so emails mm. directed towards the group or towards Wheaton community. Mm -hmm. um, in an interview with BuzzFeed, Michael Greca stated that he, uh, that why uh, we don't see this as a political statement, uh, referring to the refugee uh, scholarship. We thought it was important uh, that at this moment in time to send a strong message to the world and the, to students considering Wheaton that they have welcomed here um, members of community. Mm -hmm. uh, so do you feel that this particular scholarship in a sense has a political connotation. Do you agree with what he's saying? Yeah. No, uh, well, I think there's maybe two different parts of that. One, was it a political statement by us? No. Was it perceived as a political statement by others? The answer is clearly yes. So let me tell you why the dichotomy there. 
Uh, and actually, even if you look at the court cases that are going around right now related to the executive order, you'd see that the arguments are the same as what I was thinking of and we were thinking of here at Wheaton. There's a direct economic impact from that executive order, and we saw it almost immediately. Two quick examples. The last two summers, we've done um, a project in the summertime with students here on campus from the United Arab Emirates. The day after the executive order, we got a call saying, yeah, we're not coming this year. We don't think it's the place we want to send our students. We had a student uh, who we'd accepted who was a citizen of Switzerland and the U.S., dual citizen, uh, and she contacted us and said, you know, I'm not going to study in the U.S. The political climate is not what I want for my studies. So it was clear to us that this executive order uh, already had and would continue to have a very strong impact on who comes to this campus and the kinds of things we can do outside with the global world. Um, so a lot of the discussions we had about it is how can we send a message that's consistent with our values that will help stem the, st stem the tide of the economic losses we might suffer from something like this. So the court case, in fact, that's being argued today in San Francisco, I think all of the briefs that have been filed look at the economic impact that the way this order was rolled out. Not so much, but I don't, I, first of all, I 100% I, I support uh, the importance of uh, having a secure border and making sure that immigrants uh, or that refugees and others coming to the country uh, are fully vetted and that we you know, maintain our safety and security here. But uh, the executive order wasn't the best way to get at that, I guess is the way I would describe it. So I take no exception at all to the goal, um, but as many others have, it's just the way this thing was rolled out and the chaos we've seen it create and that economic impact. One, um, the Chronicle of Higher Education, which is the official publication of uh, higher ed professionals, estimates that the direct impact of this order alone on higher education it is $700 million in the next few months alone. So um, that would be devastating to higher ed. It would be devastating to Wheaton College. So the action was uh, about our values and about addressing something that we knew would have economic impact. I'm not naive for a second. I didn't think that it, would, uh, that it wouldn't create people who on either side of the debate felt strongly about what we did. Um, We've seen we've seen both of those you know sides of the debate, and um, <clears throat> you know those who are supportive, um, and it has been the vast majority. We've been tracking all the postings and the news stories and things, and it's about 89 percent was our last estimate, positive or or neutral, meaning people just shared the story with others. Um, you know those people obviously who are on that side, you know, view it as a strong statement about a value system. Those on the other side have some some really valid criticisms that we've been able to address uh, and actually turn even a few of those who criticize the action into advocates because we are not closing the door on U.S. students, for example. We are not bringing dangerous individuals into our community. Uh, and we are really just focused on what higher education in the U.S. has always been about, an inclusive global environment. Excellent. Well, I think we should transition over and talk a bit about you personally and uh, some of the things you've been doing here. You've That's been too boring. Let's talk about something. Let's talk about the Patriots. Well, you yeah, know? No, great game, wasn't it? Yeah. Did yeah. you watch the end over time? You know, I almost dozed off in the third quarter, but I rallied and stayed awake for the whole thing. That's so. when uh, the Patriots were doing the exact same thing. <laughs> yes, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Um, so I think the main thing that I, I kind of want to talk about is you've been here for about three years, yes? Yep. Uh, and I think... A lot of times we don't necessarily see what happens uh, when a president has certain initi initiatives, uh, certain ideas about what they want to do. Sometimes we'll see them in small ways, but one large way that we really saw a huge change was uh, this upcoming year when uh, a lot of freshmen, the, the cl freshman class expanded mm -hmm. to about 500 students. Um, I, you know, Ted Meese, uh, an alum professor and reporter for WPRI, uh, he wanted to know, will you know, we be reaching 2,000 plus students soon? Uh, mm -hmm. Is this a goal of yours, ultimately? So uh, it's a great question, um, and it you know, gets back to probably the largest challenge that uh, small liberal arts schools face, and not just Wheaton. Uh, it's around enrollment and the financial model. Um, 
it's a, it's a com very competitive environment uh, for students in higher education in today's world. And, you know, all you got to do is I just picked up uh, yesterday another news story about a college in Indiana of about over a thousand students closing, you know, so there are a lot of schools that are in such financial difficulty that uh, they've had to close the doors. Uh, Wheaton is nowhere near that situation. We actually have a pretty, a pretty good endowment for a school our size. I wish it was a lot bigger, but it's about $200 million, and so we have some cushion to be able to operate on. However, we have suffered from uh, some declines in our enrollment. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, before I came here, I think it had been maybe four or five years in a row that we had missed our enrollment targets. And so one of the first things that I and the leadership team here at Wheaton set out to do was to figure out a way to increase the interest in Wheaton College and to uh, help create a more sustainable financial model for the college. Uh, so number one, the interest. Uh, you know, where did that big f first year class come from this year? We actually accepted fewer students this year for this class than we did last year. Really? but almost 100 more said yes to us, which is, that's called the yield. The yield rate skyrocketed. And the yield rate, you know, why does that happen? Well, it comes from students really having an affinity and, you know, kind of really wanting to be at the place that, um, you know, that they end up at. And so I think we did a lot of things, and we've been doing a lot of things to create an environment that is really attractive to students here. I mean, I think actually the refugee scholarship and the focus on creating a global community in this nice small environment is part of that. You know, life on campus, uh, I think we've been working hard at creating options for students, both curricularly and co-curricularly that are exciting. And I think that is the reason for the big increase in the yield. Uh, secondly, you know, like, so what's the target? Uh, first of all, we way overshot the target this past year. Uh, we would like to bring in, you know, just under 500 or around 500 students a year, uh, and that's the goal for this year. Over time, that would probably result in a uh, campus size of around 1,800 students. We're at 1,650 right now, so it's not a huge increment, but yes, it will it'll mean that, uh, you know, we're thinking about a new residence hall already and thinking about the other resources that we'd have to have to, to handle that slightly larger population. But I also think, you know, what is, the, what is the perfect size? I mean, if you look at schools that are in our category, you know, it is between 1,800 and 2,200. Um, I don't think in my time here we'll hit 2,000, but, um, you know, I think somewhere in that 1,800 to 2,000 range in the long run is a good place for Wheaton College to settle into. I don't think it would seem that much bigger, but uh, would help uh, create new energy and, and help with some of the financial challenges we face. So I think also you mentioned the new residence hall. That's in a 10-year plan, I believe, for, yep. for Wheaton. Uh, and that'd be going behind Young. Is the, is the How theory? do you know that? So, <laughs> uh, I, the answer is that's one of the options being considered. Yes. But uh, it isn't, you know, it's nowhere near, um, you know, kind of being on the drawing board just yet. We actually have a meeting of our board of trustees next week. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, sorry, this week coming up here in a couple of days. And it will be one of the major topics of discussion. I mean, I'm thinking new residence hall in 2019 or so. So obviously it takes a while to plan and build and everything. One of the places that's, you know, been considered is, you know, down in that quad area and create another kind of quad space. But, you know, we have 300 acres of land. There's lots of other places that we can consider. And that'll be, you know, job number one is thinking about where's the best place for it. And so, yes, you say 2019 for, for a potential new dorm. In between that time, how are you, um, in particular, in residential life, going to try and ease that kind of mm -hmm. uh, transition? Especially yep. since this year, a lot of students were in triples. Yep. Um, making it. Yeah. So it's interesting, you know, the debate over triples and doubles and things like that. So even though this first year class was so large, this is not a year that uh, set the record for number of students on campus because we'd had a couple lower years, as I mentioned before, the total number of students on campus is actually less than what it was, you know, maybe five to 10 years ago. Uh, it creates triples. Um, 
but we don't force triples into you know s tiny little rooms that are made for one or the smaller doubles. Uh, it's interesting, you know, and of course, you know, you know, no one, everybody would love a single. Well, maybe everybody would love a single, but that's not going to happen. And the discussions I've had with some of the students in triples, because now there's room on campus with people who graduate and things like that, they want to stay in the triples. You know, they like those. So, uh, so one option is, you know, and I don't think we're going to hit a point where we're going to need to like triple up or, you know, do other things. Uh, you know, there's three empty bedrooms in this house, so maybe we can fit some people here in the president's house. Uh, you know, another thing that happens is uh, while there's 1,650 students at Wheaton, there are not 1,650 students on campus. One way to actually handle some of that increase is to encourage students to take advantage of many of the great programs we have where you can study abroad. I know we were talking earlier about your study abroad experience. So that if uh, more students take advantage of that, it actually relieves the housing pressure as well. And we're looking at some creative options for students to study in other places within the U.S. even. So, and, you know, watch for those to roll out in the next, you know, 12 to 18 months, I would say, as we start to build those. Yeah. So this, would that be kind of something uh, as simple as, like, um, I know UNH has a program similar to that where you can study within the U.S. Would that be, like, going to, like, California and Florida? Or yeah, like you know, our, our goal is to create um, Wheaton options where students could spend a semester studying in Boston for the whole semester, studying and living in Boston, or pick a place, New York or L.A. or anything. We're not at any point where, you know, I can tell you, oh, this is exactly what we're doing. But those are some of the discussions we're having. And, you know, if you get 15 or 20 students who are doing that in addition to the study abroad, then the housing crunch on campus is eased by students doing things they really want to do uh, and looking at those options. Mm -hmm. So a lot of exciting discussions. So. Uh. So we have one final question. It's from Hannah. She says, how does DeHanno stay so consistently good at his job? Um, <laughs> good? Uh, I don't know if good is a, so that's a qualitative ju judgment. Why don't, I, so. why don't I rephrase yeah. it uh, in a way that, that could maybe seem more approachable so you're not uh, feeling yeah. like you have to. But I think, uh, yeah. you know, I think a lot of students are wondering, uh, you know, they're, they're becoming these professional individuals, particularly from uh, groups and promotional uh, professional development things that you've done uh, in the past year mm. or two, including the Wind Team, Imagine, Wheaton Edge, uh, you know, these certain things, they, you know, they're learning how to become these leaders in, mm -hmm. in their industry and yep. professionals. So I think in a large part, what do you think uh, has made you a good leader or things that you think go into making a good leader? Yep. Well, I appreciate the question. I think, uh, so first of all, I love what I do. I, I just wake up every morning and I just think how to get so lucky to be able to work at such an incredible place and in such a, a key role that can make things happen. And then secondly, you know, uh, it's been a few years since I was a student, but I'm, I'm very introspective and very, you know, focused on what the student experience is. You know, and, um, you know, some people are external in their focus and some people aren't. And, and for me, I have to have both that external and internal focus. So uh, that's why I try to be engaged with as many things as I can on campus so I can hear and I can see and I can talk to students about what they need. And I think that's what leadership really is, is not so much coming in and saying, this is what I'm going to do. It's really about understanding what we can do and how we can do it together. So all of those things you rattled off, None of them were my ideas. Uh, you know, oh, they're all ideas that I get from talking to other people. And I, I will be the one who stews and says, hmm, how could we do that? And then I get people to help me figure out how to do it. But, uh, you know, I think it's about making incremental progress. It's about keeping people really engaged in the community. And I have had uh, a great three years here and looking forward to many more. And, um, you know, it's just a great place to live and to work and to learn. and so many great students like you to get to work with and so I love every minute of it. All right, thank you for having us today. Well, thank you for taking the time to come and talk with me. I really enjoyed it. All right. If you want to see more information, you can pick up a Wheaton Wire copy next Wednesday and thank you very much for watching.